I'm not really one to believe in sea monsters or anything strange or that supposedly doesn't exist, like fairy tales or mermaids, but I had a very strange thing happen to me with my friend and I back in May when we went fishing outside the coast of Florida. I'm not an experienced fisherman by any stretch of the means, but I do enjoy fishing as a hobby, and so my buddy Ryan is a pretty good fisherman. He goes off coast fishing all the time. At least, I believe it's called coast fishing. Well, that's what he calls it. So he's taken me a handful of times, but this time was just like any other time. And with the whole COVID thing going on, I figured a nice day fishing would have been good for both of us. Everything went pretty normal, up until a few hours after we were anchored, where we saw these large shapes start circling around our small boat. At first, I almost pondered if they were dolphins, but I thought dolphins come in bigger pods, and I don't know what kind and size they come in, but these seemed to be a little bit bigger than a dolphin, and were shaped differently too. The weird thing was their behavior. They were shaped differently too, and they had a different color, if I'm making any sense at all. Like, they were dark. You couldn't really make out details, and they seemed to have long tails at the end of them, and they kept swimming in the groups of three that they came in. They would circle around our boat for a little bit, then swim out a little ways. Then, they would swim back to us. It was strange, and I wasn't really sure what to make of it. Even my buddy Ryan was weirded out. We weren't sure what to do. We continued to cast our rods, and just try and fish like normal, ignoring whatever these fish or marine life was. Well, they never got close enough to the surface that we were accurately able to see what they were. I'm going to go with dolphins, but dolphins still don't act like that, nor do they swim like that. And these things, whatever they were, hung around our boat for probably two to three hours. We weren't dumping chum in the water at all, so I'm not too sure if they were just curious about our boat or what. They never tried to jump on our lines either so it wasn't the bait we had that was attracting them. It's still weird to think about. Now, it doesn't spook me, because I'm not scared since I didn't see anything, but it's just, I don't know, I can't quite put a finger on it. My buddy even says that that was the weirdest, most strange fishing trip he's been on, and he's been on a lot of trips out into the ocean, at least with me anyway. Not my story, but a close friend of mine's who's been fishing for well over 25 years in the Gulf of Mexico, the East Coast, and the West Coast as well, and has caught all sorts of fish, including sharks and a host of other legal and illegal fish. I'm not going to sit here and parade and advocate for those who catch sharks, but he's done it before. I'll keep the backstory pretty minimal, but I just want you to know that he's caught his fair share of fish and so when he catches something out of the ordinary, it's gonna stand out in his mind. A few years ago, he was telling me, he caught something very strange off the coast of Texas. What he caught, he described as eel-like, being very long and having these strange tendrils off the tail of its body that almost hung out behind it, kind of like the tentacles of a jellyfish. Although they weren't jellyfish-like tentacles, it was a very strange-looking creature he described. It was long like an eel, or like a serpent, but it didn't look like an eel. It kind of reminded him of a viper fish, and it was kind of bloated in the middle, and the length was around eight to nine feet in length, and about as thick as his torso. He said he had never seen a fish like it ever before, and wasn't exactly sure what to call it, or to classify it as. He took a picture, and sent it to one of his close fishing friends as well. They didn't know what the hell it was, and they had never seen anything like it either. But, him being him, didn't really put too much into it. He took it home, cut it up, and ate it, and apparently it didn't kill him. I kinda wish he would've kept the picture, or at least kept the fish, so we could show people. But with his type of personality, he's not really the type of person to catch a new species of fish, get all excited about it. He could honestly care less, whether he's seen it before or not. It's going on his grill and into his stomach. That's pretty much his attitude on it. With the whole quarantine thing going on lately, we ended up talking 
and I somehow got on the topic of catching fish, and we talked about that for a while, in which I asked him what was the strangest catch he's ever had, and then that came to his mind and he told me about it. Anyway, I just thought I'd like to share this with you, since you might find it interesting. I wanted to send you this email, because just recently, I happened to stumble across your video series about lake and sea monsters, and was blown away by the amount of stories you've received from fellow fishermen and sea adventurers. Even though I may not be a fisherman, or a sea adventurer by any means, I have many friends that are, and a couple off the top of my head that I know currently reside in England, and they have some crazy stories to tell. In fact, I'll have to put you in touch with them, because the stories they have will blow your mind. But there is one story that they shared with me recently, and although I might be terrible at retelling what they've told me, I can kind of tell you the gist of it. They were both fishing somewhere off the coast of England. I don't exactly know the location, because I don't quite remember if they relayed that to me. But they both told me something very large bumped the bottom of their boat, and then poked its head out of the water, probably not even 10 feet away, and looked at both of them. They were both shocked and scared. And keep in mind, this was a dinky little fishing boat. Not a tiny little wooden raft either, but definitely not a commercial fishing boat. They both described the creature to me as looking like some sort of aquatic dinosaur. It kind of resembled a sturgeon, is what they said, but had a very, very long neck and a tiny head that kind of looked prehistoric is the best way they can describe it. It had its mouth open, but not in a menacing way, kind of just like how some fish or creatures have their mouth open. Whatever this thing was, it was close enough that they could tell it had tiny serrated teeth and black eyes. It then dunked its head back under the water and continued as normal. Neither of them really have no idea why it bumped into their boat, or what exactly it was, and I don't think they ever really described to me what its body looked like. They just told me about how large it was. They're thinking that whatever this thing was, right when it bumped their boat, must have not realized that it did it, so that's why it stuck its head out of the water to kind of assess its surroundings, which is why it seemed to stare blankly at my two friends, and then resubmerge and continue on like nothing ever happened. They said its neck was incredibly long, easily 20 to 30 feet. And I'm not joking, it's not an exaggeration. And they said it was much longer than a giraffe's neck, and the body of this thing had to have been massive, maybe 30 to 40 feet in length, and the neck was probably around 20 to 30. They said it reached high above the water, and the head was probably roughly the size of a human torso, maybe three feet from the edge of the mouth to the back of the neck. Again, this is all just rough speculation on their end from what they saw about 20 feet away from this thing. They said it's almost impossible to know for absolute sure, but they said that's not the first time crazy stuff has happened off the coast of England. And while it is very frightening, they've assured me that weirder stuff has happened, and it's not the first time or the last they'll probably see something that isn't supposed to exist or see something that we don't know about as mankind. I'm gonna go ahead and keep their names anonymous, but one of them has a grandfather who's been a fisherman his entire life. He had a story in which years and years ago, I wanna say it was back in the 70s or the 80s, his tiny ship was attacked by what they would describe as the Kraken. And I know that sounds kind of far-fetched, but the best way they put it in a detail was it was some large octopi-like creature that was far larger than their boat that literally tried to drag them down to the depths. Of course, when it was told to me, my mind immediately went to the whole Pirates of the Caribbean Kraken scene, but I really don't think it was that large, but it must have been of significant size to be able to try and take a boat down, so who knows? After all, there are all sorts of large predatory creatures in the ocean, some that live so deep will never ever know about their existence. I don't want to make this too long, so I'll go ahead and reach out to my friends and have them send you over some amazing stories, and we'll see where we can go from there. But in the meantime, just try and stay out of the ocean, 
It's obvious that there are things living in there that we can't even comprehend. After all, mankind is very arrogant in what we believe we have discovered and what ceases to exist, only for a few years later to find out that that was a lie and things actually do exist that we thought were long extinct. When I was around 11 years old or so, my family was invited out to my second cousin's wedding down in Texas. She was marrying the nephew of an extremely high-ranking employee of a massive oil company. Just to be careful, and for the sake of everybody's privacy, I won't name which one. Also, I am not sure how much I can disclose without potentially getting into legal trouble, but basically, the entire family is very, very wealthy. I'm talking like the 1% kind of wealthy. While my cousin didn't come from a particularly rich background herself, she was incredibly smart, was the valedictorian of her class, and had gotten a scholarship to a prestigious university where she met her to-be husband. Their wedding was going to be absolutely massive, and as far as I knew, had no budget. The invitation to the ceremony even told us to expect the time of our lives and to skip Disneyland this year. The actual wedding ceremony would only take place on one day, but the festivities were over the course of a week and we were told to treat it no different than a vacation. My immediate family was all the way up in Pennsylvania and we were provided with the money from the groom's family to buy top quality suits and dresses for the event and were even given free first-class tickets for our flight to Texas. It was a nice gesture, but it was pocket change for them, really, and I'm sure they wanted everybody to look as good as possible. Regardless, living a mundane suburban middle-class life family made my family excited for the occasion. It would be quite the change of pace from what we were used to. We arrived just a few days before the wedding, so we could get settled in. My immediate family was provided with our own cottage to stay in, as were all of the other guests. The land in which the house resided on was several hundred acres, large, filled with forestry. It even included a secluded little village with charming shops and restaurants. To top it all off, all of this was bordered by a massive lake. I spent most of my first day there, walking around or being hauled around in golf carts with my family. I reunited with the relatives that I hadn't seen in a while and met my to-be in-laws. Most of them were polite enough, but our extremely stark differences in class did make things feel awkward. That evening during dinner, I was invited by a member of the groom's family to have a kid's sleepover on one of the yachts the following evening. My parents were a bit hesitant to let me go, but ultimately agreed when our in-laws reassured them that they would all be well supervised and the boat was equipped with many security cameras. So, if one of the kids went missing, it'd be pretty easy to track down where they went. I was mostly excited to have the opportunity to actually hang out with other kids my age. The next morning after breakfast, I was boarding the boat as they planned to have us go fishing that afternoon. It was absolutely massive. I swore it was nearly as long as a football field. We were told that if we really wanted to, we could each have our own bedroom, and I'd say there were about 30 of us on board. After they made sure everybody was in the boat, we waved off to our parents and relatives as it began to churn forward. I remember holding onto the railings and watched the water below. After about 15 minutes, we had arrived at the spot that we would be fishing in. We were taken to an area of the boat that was solely dedicated to fishing and were provided with our fishing rods and bait. We had fun and caught a lot of things. We kept the fish in a cooler so the cooking staff that were brought along with us could prepare dinner. I spent a lot of the day exploring the boat. I mean, it had everything. It had its own arcade, bowling alley, aquarium, pretty much anything cool and fun you can think of. We were given fancy snacks and candy I'd never even heard of before. And when it was time for dinner, we had an all-you-can-eat buffet with such a wide array of foods that I didn't even know where to begin. 
I was absolutely stuffed by the end of the hour. Most of the kids decided to wind down in the yacht's movie theater, so I tagged along. I actually found the rich kids to be a bit annoying and stuck up, but I was having a good time with my cousins, and that was all that mattered. I knew it would be an occasion we'd be talking at family reunions for years, perhaps even decades to come, and I wanted to make the most out of it. We put on our first movie, Jaws. The age range of kids was about 8 to 13, and the adults on the boat promised to not tell our parents that we viewed the film, and that they were cool. After a couple of hours, everybody seemed to settle down to sleep. I nodded off, but awoke to the feeling of a bang, followed by a harsh rocking of the boat. Not surprisingly, this tore the other kids out of their sleep too. They began to ask what was going on, and the younger ones cried about how it was Jaws. After a couple of minutes, it happened again, perhaps even more forceful this time. Some kids were screaming at this point, and I was trying to figure out what in the lake could even be big enough to make the yacht rock with such a force. The lights flicked on, and I squinted as my eyes adjusted to the brightness. One of the adults was here by now and was urging us to calm down. Some kids left the room and I was curious to see what was going on. So I went along with them. We were yelled at to stay in the room, but didn't listen. I looked over the railing and saw splashing from besides the boat, and then heard a loud echoing groan, like that of a whale's. Some speculated it was a whale, but others reminded them that whales don't live in fresh water. The boat was still slightly rocking from the force of whatever was moving around it, and I had to hold onto the railing just to keep my balance. In the light that the yacht provided, I swore I can make out what looked to be part of a massive fin peek out from above the water before disappearing back underneath. After a couple of minutes and talking among the other kids, I noticed the silhouette of a serpent far in the distance with the humps of its body sticking out from the lake in a parabola-like manner. Its head looked to be similar to what you'd expect to see on a lizard. The serpent went back under the surface, and all was quiet. We stayed up for about an hour or so after, waiting for its return, but it never came back. We finally went to bed, all of us exhausted the following morning. We were still pretty excited by the event though, and it was all we talked about. Some kids even called and texted their parents about it. I didn't have a cell phone at the time, but I was anxious to tell my parents. By the time we returned to the docks, it was nearly time for lunch, and that's when I caught up with my family and told them what had happened. They seemed mostly confused, but glad I was okay. Later on in the evening, I found out the groom's family had called out a crew to inspect the yacht to make sure it wasn't damaged. They were told that the underbelly had quite a few hefty dents and that they were lucky that a hole wasn't pierced. There was some drama among the family, mostly on them debating whether or not the incident was some crude assassination attempt or possibly a terrorist attack. I heard staff were fired for not reporting the incident right away or returning the boat back to the docks that night. It was a mess. There was already a lot of security at that wedding, and it only doubled down. Now, I'm not entirely sure what happened next, but word had gotten out the next day that there was a wreckage of a small fishing boat and was found dispersed throughout the lake. From what was left of it, the authorities can make out that this belonged to a man who had been missing since the night we were out on the water. His body was nowhere to be found. It was quickly believed that there was some sort of bombs or other artillery in the water but as kids who had been there that night knew differently. Most of us pieced together that the monster must have destroyed the man's boat before he was eaten. When we tried to relay the theory to the older folks, we weren't met with a lot of positive reception. I received a few scoldings about needing to respect the dead and consider how his family must feel, and that I needed to take the threat of a terrorist attack more seriously, as only a handful of years have passed since 9-11. At the same time, all of the guests were encouraged to keep as quiet as possible as to not attract the attention of media and potentially ruining the wedding. Despite all of this, 
The wedding proceeded as normal and went smoothly. Towards the end, the trip was as fun and eventful as it was. When I was finally back home, I had the chance to tell my friends about it, and one of my friends said that his grandpa saw the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland before he immigrated to the US, and hypothesized that it was a species of dinosaur that never actually went extinct as the water helped create a protective barrier between them and the meteor that struck the earth. Whatever the case, I know what I saw, and I still stand by it after all of these years. As far as I'm aware, the man's body was never discovered, and he still remains missing to this day. I don't exactly spend a lot of time too invested in trying to find more evidence, and I'm not exactly a Nessie fanatic. Still, I figured I might as well get my story out there. It'd be nice to hear if anybody else had a similar experience down here in Texas. People say that the things you experience as a child can shape you. The lessons we learn, both good and bad, help to form the adult you become. Then that there will be some encounters, experiences, things you go through in life that will forever haunt you. Whether that is true for most folks, I don't know. But what I do know for certain is this. I will never ever forget the day of my 16th birthday. It was the end of summer, and we had not long to start back at school. The evenings were still drawn out, but starting to bring a very welcome suggestion that it was finally starting to cool down a little bit. I was fortunate that my birthday fell at the weekend, so me and a whole bunch of my buddies spent the afternoon at the lake. I can remember my grandfather telling stories about some creature that he had supposedly been sighted out in the lake back when he was a boy. He hadn't seen anything himself, but it had been the talk of the town at the time, besides a couple of old newspaper reports that were framed in the town hall. It just became a legend that was whispered about around the campfire. You know well those kinds of stories. And if you've ever been in Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts, you probably know well what I'm talking about. Of course, once you get a bunch of excited kids all riled up after a day in the sun, some of us may be looking to impress a certain girl. Talk of the famous yet mysterious late creature was inevitable, as was the dare for a couple of us to stay at the lake after dark and see if we could be the ones to wake it from its 50 odd year slumber. Bravado is one thing at the daytime, and if I hadn't been buoyed by the look in the girl's eyes, I wouldn't have found myself sitting on the shore of the lake at 2 a.m. whilst my buddy had the good sense to doze off. Of course he would do that. He was always that kind of kid that always let me take the fall for things, and in this case, he wanted it easy, while I decided to be the brave one. I can't say I was scared, not then anyway, but I was certainly on edge a little. I mean, even though they were just stories, you can't tell me you wouldn't be nervous too, sitting on the lakeside, expecting something to happen, and then continuously telling yourself, it's just a story. I didn't believe for one second that I would actually see anything, but... Your eyes play tricks on you when you only have a campfire and the beam of your torch to see by. It makes for a very haunting atmosphere, if I do say so myself. That was when I heard the noise. Splashing, actually. Coming from what sounded like the middle of the lake. Fairly quiet, but unmistakably silent in the night. My first stupid thought was a shark or even an alligator even though this was just a plain lake, not sea or swampland, and there never have been reports of either of those things here. I even kind of chuckled at the thought of it in the moment, feeling foolish and very silly. After my brain kicked in, I stood up carefully and crept ever closer to the shoreline. Then, I shone the powerful torch out onto the lake. I think the only reason I didn't drop the damn thing was that I was frozen with fear to start. 
I'll likely never be able to accurately describe what I saw, as my eyes didn't want to believe it. But I'll try the best I can. Despite being a fair way out, I could see its head very clearly, thanks to the illumination of the beam. It resembled that of an alligator, but instead of the powerful, flattish torso, this thing looked like it was attached to a long, thick spine. Kind of like maybe, I don't know, an anaconda? The splashing was being made by what I presumed with its tail, which was long and very long away from its head. Meaning this thing was huge. That was when it turned, as if sensing the light from the shore. I caught one glance of those wild lizard-like eyes. They almost glowed a very dull yellow. I remember screaming and dropping the light. Of course, my scream woke up my buddy, and by the time I'd picked it back up, he joined me with his own. There was nothing. No more noise. And sure as hell, no more sightings of anything of that. Over the following months, all sorts of people headed back down to the lake. Kids with their phones, even scientists, and even biologists from what I was told. But nothing. Anyway, I know what I saw that night. I still see its face in my dreams and in my sleep. I'll never forget it. It's something so out of the ordinary, so out of our world, that you can't mistake it. There was no other fish or animal it could have been. I can't believe it actually exists. My father was a fisherman, and whenever he had some free time, he was always spending it out on the lake. Sometimes he'd travel to experience different places, catch different kinds of fish. In fact, he actually spent a lot of time traveling to different areas of the country, different states, visiting the prime fishing locations, whether it be on a lake or even by sea. Whenever or wherever we went on vacation, somewhere for my father to enjoy his favorite pastime was always of utmost importance. He'd caught all sorts of things over the years and won several prizes, as he attended fishing competitions even. In fact, he even had a photo in his local diner holding a huge fish that he brought back that same day and cooked it for a special meal. One time, I remember he was really excited as mother had finally convinced him we could go on a cultural visit to New Orleans and he could visit the bayou. Whilst my mother and I enjoyed jazz and all the other amazing things that New Orleans offers, my father was setting up all the best equipment, ready for a long day in the swampy rivers. And just so you know, the bayous and the swamps outside of New Orleans aren't necessarily safe. They can get very dangerous very quickly to those who are unexperienced and don't know what they're doing. Mother and I got back to the hotel late, intending to freshen up before heading back out to try some prized New Orleans gumbo. My father was often gone for hours at a time, sometimes crawling back into bed late out at night, only to wake us up in the morning with tales of wonders and amazement from lakes. But we were real surprised to find him back in the hotel room before us, and looking very pale and shaky. Not his normal at all. He's done and seen a lot, and he doesn't get scared, especially from fishing. Mother had been concerned that he might have seen an alligator, but even then, unless he had a one-on-one -on -one wrestling match, there's no reason he should be afraid of an alligator. But my father shook his head when prompted with the question. He'd taken his shotgun with him, just in case, but what he'd seen wasn't a reptile, or so he said. I remember asking him, what was it? What does that even mean? He told me that he ain't never seen anything that looked like this. I remember just how scared he was. He shook his entire body as he explained. This thing he saw ain't like anything he's ever seen. My father told me that Mama had been sitting enjoying the calmness 
and hoping to snag a catfish or two. Which, by the way, catfish are some of his favorite. Although, compared to other fish, I can't stand the flavor. Anyway, he started to pull the line in with such force, it damn near dragged the whole thing into the water. He grabbed a hold of it, intending to reel it in, and feeling excited about what he might find. But the line snapped with the force of whatever was pulling on the other end. My father at this point grew very frustrated and frightened, grabbed his net with his long pole, wafting it around the water, trying to find what had just caused his line to break, and he suddenly, from what he explained to us, caught sight of this catch. I swear at that point, he was even more pale. His forehead became even more shiny, and he began to become really clammy. It's like he was going through a nervous breakdown, just telling us this. It scared me. I had never seen him look like that. My mom, her eyes getting so big, asked what in God's name did you see? At first, my father explained that he thought it was a huge snake, and explained that it was huge, had a very thick reptilian body, but was completely white. I thought it was maybe some kind of albino river snake. I could just see its long body. But then he said the head came up to the surface, and this is where I thought he was going to cry. It wasn't no snake. He said it had a face that was like a giant sandworm. No eyes, just a huge gaping mouth that peeled open from its head. And the teeth, the teeth on this thing, were just monstrous. This creature looked like something out of the Star Wars universe. It didn't make any sense. Well, the rest of our time there on vacation, he stayed out of the bayou. And in fact, going completely out of character, did not fish for the rest of the time we were there. Which, again for him, it's all this man ever does or knows. It took him weeks to finally get the courage to go back fishing at all. I've spent time googling and researching over the years, but never found any other sighting of a supposed giant albino sandworm type of river monster in Louisiana or any nearby areas. But I knew someday I'd find somebody to share the story with. Only my mother and I know. I haven't even told my friends because it sounds very bizarre, but I'm telling you, my father doesn't make up stories, and why would he make this up and not go fishing the rest of the time we were on vacation? It would make no sense. So everyone tells you, when you're out in the ocean, or on a small sailing boat with your mates, you have to be careful of sharks, and all the other terrible things that are in the water. We all know that sharks are a thing to look out for, so it makes sense that you don't go out somewhere without a shed load of protective gear, if Jaws is supposedly around. Even an idiot knows that. But what people tend to warn you about are sea monsters, or in this case, I should mention the things that people don't warn you about. This is simply because they are considered things of legends, lore, fairy tales, am I right? See, here in the United Kingdom, we don't necessarily have shark infested waters like much of the other parts of the world. Too bloody cold, I expect. But what we do have, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't got a clue what they are, and no. In this particular case, I'm not talking about Nessie. We were off the coast of Scotland, so maybe, just maybe it was her cousin. Another dinosaur-like being roaming the free ocean. Me and some mates had decided to take a little fishing boat out, just for a bit of fun. A couple of the lads and I were on the beers, but I was feeling a bit dodgy. Turns out, I got a tad seasick. And my mate, who we'll call Jay, was in charge of making sure that we did not capsize. See, it's very important that you have somebody dedicated to this alone. Dan, who was on the beer, suddenly shouts out, Lads, Nessie has come to see us, and he's brought his girlfriend. 
thinking Dan was trying to wind us up, and we just laughed and played along, looking over the side of the boat and pretending to be scared. Nearly got me there, I called back to him. I expected a slap on the back and a gotcha. Instead, Dan looked pissed off. He told me he wasn't joking, and he was quite serious. He explained to me there's something out there. Humoring him a bit longer, we looked over the site again, and this is the time we all saw them. It wasn't Nessie, as I said, since she is meant to be massive. That's not to say that these things were small. Each was roughly the length of a small boat, and as wide as a large man. There was many of them, and they seemed to have elongated necks, kind of like a giraffe, or what you would see in typical illustrations of a brontosaurus. But their body was much more aquamarine-like, kind of like a fish. They had little fin-like limbs, kind of just like a sea turtle has, but their heads were very reptilian, with huge wide amber eyes on the sides of their faces. Again almost identical to your stereotypical illustration of a brontosaurus's face. We all stood watching, frozen in fear. Well, except Dan, who must have had our share of the beers as well. After proving his point, he nodded off on the floor of the boat. These things didn't try anything, just circled us a few times, following each other around and around. Then, as quick as they appeared, they were gone. Just like that, they had just submerged in the water and were gone without a trace, never to be seen. So, Jay hit the motor in that instance and we got the hell out of there. I have never really told anybody about it or until now because I didn't want to admit how scared I was. I don't think we saw a monster, even though I want to believe that. But maybe, the more I reflect back on it, we just saw a pod of living, breathing dinosaurs. Either way, I truly believe that we were lucky that day, and whatever those creatures were, dinosaurs or not, they weren't hungry to put up a fight. And thank God for that, because we would have all been goners for sure had they had a taste for meat, specifically human flesh. Deep sea diving is both breathtakingly beautiful and crap your pants scary as hell, especially if you've ever been in areas where visibility is very poor. I'm talking in murky waters where you can't even see your own hand in front of your face, regardless of the light or not. It makes you feel extremely vulnerable, like anything can come out and grab you in any given moment, even more so if you're a fan of scary movies and scary movies underneath the ocean. I've been doing it for years, and let me tell you, it's true when they say that the man has barely scraped the surface in discovering sea life. I would like to consider myself experienced at the amount of dives I've done, but even I too still panic sometimes at just the thoughts of the unknown. I have seen things down there that would fuel your nightmares for the rest of your life. Many divers will laugh at me for this, but I'm going to continue my story and come out with the truth. It goes without saying that I'm sure rescue missions, or what they consider bringing bodies back from wreckages, is easily one of the worst parts of being an official diver. But finding bloated, rotten, half-eaten corpses is by no means the reason I'll never dive again. No, that was down to the day that I came face to face with what I can only call the Kraken. Something far worse than getting the bends. Now sure, you could laugh at me, because it might sound ridiculous, and you can believe that I must have suffered an underwater hallucination, or that my oxygen was low, or that I got far too much nitrogen in my blood. But I know what I saw. I was the deepest I'd ever been down that day, on account of there having been a particularly nasty accident with a cruise liner. Several bodies were still missing. And as you guessed it, it was yours truly job to retrieve them. Something 
other than myself was stirring up the water, not too far from me. So, knowing what I know, I was very careful to keep my distance. But that is when I saw it. You might ask why a kraken, and not just a giant sea octopus. Well, here's the thing. You ever seen an octopus as big as an entire shipwreck? I didn't hang about to count those limbs either, but it held at least two, what must have been once human bodies in its grasp. One look at its face and monstrous yellow eyes was enough for me to get out of there. Nobody ever believed me, but those missing tourists never turned up either. I know what I saw at the bottom, and I'm never going to go back down there. I might sound cliche, I know, but I'm terrified, and I'm not really a great storyteller, so I apologize in advance if this comes off hokey, but I'm telling you what I saw, and I've done many dives before and have never seen such a creature. In fact, if the roles were reversed and you were indeed telling me this story, I would probably laugh at you and explain to you that nothing such creature exists down in the waters. But I'll have to admit that I was wrong, and it scared me so bad. Not because it could have taken my life, but because the sheer randomness of it, the mystery, the potential, and knowing there might be even worse, that there might be even larger things down there that I didn't come across. Those things keep me up at night, and when I think back to this experience, it's all the more haunting for me, and another nail in the coffin as to why I'm done diving, at least for the time being. Hello, what lurks beneath. I am writing this email to you, in desperation. I'm struggling to want to end my life, and perhaps if you are reading this, hopefully I have not succeeded at this point. But my life has been extremely worrisome, at least for the last 15 years. I'm 83 years old, and my name is Muriel. I and the rest of my family is all based around the Cambridge, England area. And by all account, it has been a tranquil, middle-class, happy life. But I feel like my time has passed. I have weak bones now, weak organs, and I feel my vision and sight are going rapidly. I feel if I don't do this, it is time to go. But before I do end up dying, I would like to finish up any unfinished business. And one of those businesses lies in what happened during the summer of 1980 while on the island of Jersey. I was on holiday there with three of my children, who were aged 7 to 17 at the time. It was by all my memories a most very peaceful and serene holiday. The children enjoyed playing in the ocean, building sandcastles, and my husband was a huge fan of golf. But something happened, something that has stalked my memory for nearly 40 years now. In fact, I remember it now more vividly than ever, just because I've had time to process it and really absorb what I saw. We had to put the children to bed, and the eldest was in the room. So, myself and my husband went for a little walk along the sea, at around 10 or maybe 11 p.m. Either way, it was after dark, and it was quiet. I just remember feeling a sense of pure peace, at least at the time. My husband bribed me to follow him onto the beach and wet our feet along the cool shore. It was very enticing, romantic, and wonderful. I have been a big fan of the ocean, but the breeze at night as well as the rhythmic sounds of the waves was just utter pure relaxation. I can even tell you the white summer dress that I wore, almost down to a tee, and I remember how comfortable it was. That's just how well my memory is of this event. I was a little weary that there was nobody else around which was usually very bustling with activity. But I guess 10, 11 p.m. at night was the cutoff. I walked arm in arm with my husband and even put my head on his shoulder. I kicked the waves and had fun. What happened next, though, took us right out of our illusion of paradise 
and plunged us into a movie of horror. Life seemed perfect in that very moment because it was at the age of 43 on that beach and that if God creates all creatures, then he creates some monsters within the spectrum of creation too. A sharp dagger jutted into my lower leg, just above my ankle. I began screaming and fell into my husband's arms. When we turned around, both of us began screaming at the top of our lungs. A wild, unidentifiable creature with fangs had pierced right through my lower leg and was still clutched onto me with what I can only describe as a venomous fury. The creature was green and what seemed to be thick and scaly, leather skin, and it was hard as a rock. It was in the shape of what appeared to be a duck, but its body was windy and bendy like that of a snake, so that its head propelled up out of the water, and then its stomach went under the water before its lower abdomen rose above the water. It was most abnormal and repulsive in sight. Its face, however, was oddly that of a lizard, with large glowing eyes, large black slits, and what appeared to be a beak, kind of like that of an octopus or a squid, which extended into two large fangs. It's very hard to describe. This thing seemed to be embedded into my lower leg, and clenched on with power and strength. All I can remember is screaming in horror as my husband tried to kick this beast, but it kept worming around and didn't let go of my leg. I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen. I nearly fainted in fear. This thing croaked and groaned in fury and agitation as my husband tried his best to save me. I felt a tug as this thing seemed to want to pull me into the water. I remember screaming no and my husband did his best to hold on. I was then pulled off my feet and onto the ocean floor. I could feel my leg being pulled with force and purpose into the depths of the water. The next thing that happened was I felt a release and then a sharp dull pain. And the next thing, I woke on the sand with my husband bandaging up my wound with his shirt. He told me that believe it or not, Three dolphins formed a ring around myself and the beast, and the beast retreated. I shudder to think that what would happen if that beast would have pulled me further into the sea. I wouldn't be here today. In fact, it is surprising that I remember all of this, even though I do have an early onset of dementia. But as I'm typing this out, in hopes that this thing can be identified, if people think that sharks are vicious, well, think again. Whatever this was, was intent on killing me, and only waste deep water. It was forceful, brutish, and had bloodthirsty, savage instincts. Now, I feel like I'm at the end of my life, and I want to put things all right. So, I sincerely hope that such a beast is not a part of the world in generations to come. For I fear sincerely for our children and their children. Alright, so I'm sharing this story on behalf of my uncle. See, he's nowhere near tech savvy enough to share a story through anything other than a paper. And embarrassingly enough, he still prefers to write pen and paper in a letter format. So, I try to convince him that this is easier. He also isn't sober long enough to string together coherent sentences. But don't tell him I said that. He has a little bit of a part-time job to keep himself busy, in his twilight years, I like to call it. I guess it keeps him from constantly drinking himself to poverty and death. He's part of a rotating crew on a little barge on the Mississippi River. He doesn't always spend all of his time on the clock working though. He's actually often waiting on other people to make sure he's free to go, or to pick things up, and so forth. It's usually between those periods of time when he's waiting on an okay that he whips out a bottle and begins drinking. Then he gets sentimental and fires up his radio. Do you know anybody that still listens to their AM radio? Yeah, 
That's my uncle, all the way. And it's also times like that, that he dares to cast a line over the edge of the boat and see if he catch anything. The river fish around this area are very unhealthy, but that common knowledge is far gone to a daily drinker like him. The man is going to do what he wants. So, there he was, drinking, fishing, and getting nostalgic. He had already caught a couple of bluegill and a rather large catfish, so large that it wasn't even safe to keep. You know, parasites and the like. If you're not a fisherman, I wouldn't expect you to understand or to know what I was talking about. He was just drunk, just drunk enough that he decided it was time to take a leak off the edge of the boat. He thought it was too foggy to worry about being seen. So, he took the radio with him because he was at that point of inebriation that he's getting really sentimental and he didn't want the music to stop. To his great irritation, there was all of a sudden what he describes to me as a wall of static, which didn't make sense because it was a local station. There's nothing that would make sense that would interfere with the signal. He could see the radio tower on a clear day even from where he was on the river. So, he calmed down just long enough to do his duty over the side of the boat, but nothing prepared him to see what he saw when he came back around to the front of the boat. There was something perched on the railing of the boat that wasn't entirely insect and wasn't entirely fish. Those were his words, not mine. It had a thickly layered carapace, like something that was a cross between an armadillo and a crab, and it appeared to have forearms that were very similar in resemblance to those of a praying mantis. Whatever it was, it had gotten into his cooler where his catches were, and it was eating his catfish. The head whirled and tilted and ground away at the fish, like some sort of organic buzzsaw, while the rest of the creature remained perfectly still, almost as if it was kind of a malfunctioning animatronic. He said that it was like watching a time-lapse film sped up, and the fish was literally melting away before his very eyes. And soon, the only thing that remained was bone and skeleton. It wasn't until it finished the last morsel that this thing noticed my uncle, and that's when it froze completely. Keep in mind, from the time this thing started devouring the fish to the time there was nothing left, it was only mere seconds. Its eyes had a strange light to them, and it was the same color and intensity of a firefly. Eyes that looked like they were meant for seeing underwater. It immediately sprang overboard and didn't come back. When he gets drunk enough, he tries telling that story to others, and they just tell him that he's the most whacked out dude they know. Or it sounds like a crazy version of the one that got away that anybody's ever heard. Me? I don't know. I've had to have my uncle tell it to me many times while he was sober so I can make a good recollection of the story and even ran by him to make sure it was good. Again, I had to get him sober to tell me this story, which took a few different tries. So, be thankful I got this coherent of a tale. I think he believes he saw something. So, in lieu of all this, I will be passing it on to your podcast, and maybe, if I'm lucky, you can read it to everybody. And if not, and you don't believe me, hopefully, stands as an interesting story, at the very least, 